Everybody, welcome. Thanks for coming to Garden Church this morning and for joining us online. My name's Dustin Payne. Uh, if you're looking for Pastor Brian, he is out this week. Uh, my kids refer to Pastor Brian as Pastor Gordon Ramsey. They started calling, hey, we, let's go to the Gordon Ramsey Church this morning. And I was like, what are you talking about? The guy who talks like Gordon Ramsey. We want to go there. I do find Pastor Brian to be a lot nicer than what I assume Gordon Ramsey is like. So... Uh, my name's Dustin. Uh, I'm here with my family. We live in Selwood, and we lead small groups uh, out that way. And uh, Pastor Brian's out, so I'll be preaching this morning on, uh, I guess we've been thinking through these big sorts of questions as a community. And this morning, we're asking a simple question that's not very simple. Why worry? Why, why worry? Why worry about anything? Uh, and as is my custom, I want to give you a little bit of a map of where we're going to go this morning. We are in Matthew chapter 6, verse 25 through 34, but <clears throat> uh, the three points I want to hit is a brief note, a tale of two cities, and Geppetto and Jesus. We've got those three. A brief note, a tale of two cities, Geppetto and Jesus. Uh, so real quick, a brief note. Um, I am not an expert on anxiety. So I wanted to make a brief clarification before beginning that if you have an anxiety disorder or you find yourself being crushed by negative self-thoughts of harm or doubt in yourself, uh, I want to urge you to talk to a mental health care professional. When I'm talking about worry and anxiety this morning, I am not talking about your experience. I'm talking about what I would call um, the anxiety of life. So just wanted to note that. Uh, I feel that sometimes mental health issues are made light of in church, and uh, my family has had some uh, real run-ins with mental health, and it's very important that you talk with someone and that you start to work through that um, with someone who knows how to help you. So I am not that person. The sort of worry that I'll be referring to today is uh, the kind of anxiety and worry we feel at all parts of our lives, um, the kind you feel when you're running late for work, and uh, the varying degrees of uh, stress that hits you um, from everything from child raising to professional development. <coughs> I wanted to start this morning with... Uh, this 2014 Psychology Today article by uh, Meg Selig, who's a licensed professional counselor, she writes this. She says, like all emotions, worry and anxiety, they actually serve many positive purposes, at least with the right doses. For example, anxiety warns us of danger or it can kind of hype you up for a peak moment. Uh, some things should have some sense of anticipation and building. Uh, but what I liked was she said, hey, here are a few things that don't work in anxiety management. Uh, number one, denial. There's nothing really to worry about. You might know this person. Sometimes I'm accused of that. Avoidance. You know, I don't have to face my fears. I'll just avoid the situation that makes me fearful. And that works for a moment, I suppose. Repression. I'll suppress my true emotions because they don't make sense anyways. Men. Obsession. Maybe if I keep thinking about this problem, I can magically solve it. Women. Uh, if these are unhealthy ways to handle our anxiety this morning, I just ask that we turn our eyes to Scripture and the wisdom of Jesus on the matter, which leads us to our two cities. So our text this morning, we're dropped straight into Matthew chapter 6, verse 25. It's in the middle of Jesus' most famous sermon. It's the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, sermon on the Mountain, right? And what we need to know about this sermon is that it happens on a specific mountain. It's called the Mount of Olives. Uh, I guess olives grew there so much so that the mountain got that name. And what's important to note is that Jesus, he's teaching on this Mountain of Olives— but there's another mountain within eyesight that he's actually looking down at, and that's what they call the Temple Mount, the mountain of the temple. And so Jesus is actually teaching from this high place. It's 75 meters higher than the Temple Mountain. They're actually looking down at this other city, this other kingdom. 
through his sermon. I think it's really important. It's almost like Jesus is offering us two kinds of cities, the city of the kingdom of God and the city of the kingdom of man. And physically, one is just higher than the other. And so what seems to be part of Jesus' illustration throughout this famous sermon, and this might sound familiar to you, is this kind of duality at which Jesus speaks. Uh, He'll say things like, well, you've heard it this way, but I'm going to tell you this way. Uh, I can only imagine maybe he even has hand gestures towards that temple mountain from the other religious leaders of his day. He's like, hey, you've heard from one kingdom, and now I'm going to tell you from another. You've heard this, so I'm going to tell you this. And and he kind of starts to flesh out two ways of living, two ways of believing, and two ways of being. He starts to form in our minds that we aren't stuck in the city of humanity. And so, right at the end of his teaching in verse 24, he just kind of finished this whole sermonette on how you cannot serve God and money. Like, this was a big teaching he did. And then we back into verse 25 here, and he says this. He says, therefore, I tell you, don't be anxious about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you're going to put on. Is not life more than food? Is not the body more than clothing? Jesus kind of anticipates this question from his previous sermonette of like, well, if I'm not going to serve, like, I can't serve two masters, I can't serve God and money, well, then how am I going to eat? What am I going to wear? And Jesus anticipates this question. He says, don't worry about these things. Don't be anxious about your own life. We know if we look at the ministry of Jesus, he's actually really concerned about the well-being of others. Uh, I want to make a brief note here. Jesus isn't saying don't take care of your neighbor. Don't worry if your neighbor has food. Don't worry if your neighbor has clothing. He's actually just talking in some ways to you, the faithful, to us, the church. It's, hey, there's this other kingdom of people that we live in believe, and be different. So you don't worry about these things, but we know that Jesus is concerned about our people eating, our people wearing clothes. Are they sustained with the necessities of life? So he says, I tell you, you don't be anxious about your life, what you're going to eat and what you're going to drink, nor about your body and what you're going to wear this morning for church. Uh, isn't life more than food? Isn't it more uh, your body than for just clothing? And what's really interesting is that food and clothing are definitely anxious realities for all people across all time until about 1900s America. Like, we live in a really rich place. Uh, Most of us do not wake up and wonder, what am I going to eat today? Uh, Even if you live here in this neighborhood and you find yourself on hard times, I know that the Union Gospel Mission has a hot meal essentially every day and that you could get food fairly easily. Uh, We had a friend in one of our small groups, Emmanuel Arthur. Uh, He was (coughs) an international student from Ghana, and he grew up in abject poverty, and there were certainly days he just did not eat. And this begins to form someone's mind. I remember we asked him if he had a food he disliked, and he said, there are a lot of foods I dislike, but there is no food I will not eat if it's in front of me. Uh, The reality is, is that we live in one of the wealthiest times and places in human history to the point that even in this important teaching from the greatest preacher of all time, uh, we don't even connect with what he's saying to be worried about our food or clothes. These aren't things you and I typically worry about. <clears throat> you, ne- you likely never wondered where your meal, your next meal was coming from. And what's fascinating about clothing, and I don't know if you know this, but Americans donate so much clothing every year to foreign countries that we actually supplant textile industries from being created. Uh, isn't this nuts? Like, we give away so much clothing that other countries don't even start manufacturing their own clothes. Right, that's how much clothing we have to give away, is that we actually kind of, in some ways, 
uh, stop industries from forming and helping countries like create more jobs in this way. There's a great book called When Helping Hurts. I can't remember the author. He points this out and says, hey, you have a lot of goodwill. We want to do a lot of good things, but maybe it doesn't always work out well. But so even to this point, we're reading about Jesus telling us not to have anxiety or worry on our life and what we're going to eat and what we're going to wear. And ironically, we're in a place where we're never worried about what we're going to eat. And we have so much clothes that we just literally are donating uh, hundreds of millions of pounds of clothes internationally every year. But we do have worries. That much is true, but it's a different set of worries that I don't think we hear Jesus teach on in this moment. These are the kinds of daily anxieties that motivate and move many of us. If you're a parent, maybe a continual question that bubbles up in your mind is, am I raising my kids right? Or am I positioning myself appropriate to the career I want or the advancement that I want to see in my professional life? There's a deeper anxiety. Will I ever make friends? Am I ever going to find a partner who loves me? For some of us, what do my parents think of me? And kind of anchored into all of those worries and thoughts is a larger question. Am I living right? And at every juncture and at every point of your life, these kinds of key questions might be troubling your soul and might create biological reactions and mental situations that you find yourself trapped or locked. Um, our chief worries in a wealthy society aren't on material possessions, they're often on social realities. So, as we are reminded of the anxieties of American life, uh, Jesus asks us to look into this kingdom city. So, in verse 26 of Matthew chapter 6, he says this. I can imagine Jesus on this mountaintop, and he's like, look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor do they reap and gather into barns, but your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not more valuable than the birds? You know, we spend so much of our time trying to control every little thing that gives us a sense of security sometimes that might alleviate some of our anxiety from moment to moment. But I really appreciate Jesus grounding us back into creation and pointing out avian wildlife for us. going on, I assume it's like via instinct, but what's amazing about animals in general is that a bird will have no trouble reproducing another bird. It's going to raise children, and those things are going to be birds, and they're going to do bird things. And meanwhile, if you're a parent, you're worried about, like, am I messing my kid up? But the reality is, is you're going to raise a human, and that human will do human kinds of things. And... God provides this system of sustenance for the birds that Jesus kind of taps into. He's like, they don't reap or sow, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. They don't gather into barns. There's actually a whole system of creation of sustenance for itself. And that God is seen as a sovereign provider of all good things, even the food for the birds. And then he says, right, as wonderful as creation in this way is, aren't you just so much more valuable than they? Verse 27, he says, And which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to his lifespan? Right, he kind of dis uh, dispels this notion that if I obsess over this thought, or if I try to avoid it, or whatever, if I'm kind of giving it all this attention, but Jesus just asks, does it really change anything for you? 
And, and I think he actually says it does change things for you. The act or action of worry, um, it takes away your relational, emotional, and sometimes your biological energy. How many of you who have been anchored on deep anxiety have just not had time for your spouse or your friends or your schoolwork or your career or that book that you picked up that you swear you're going to read one day, right? Like there's just no time because you've invested so much emotional energy on what you have no control over. You've invested so much of yourself in something that won't add to your life. And actually they did a 2016 study in psychology that found out that People with severe anxiety disorders actually have shorter lifespans. It turns out all of that energy that you use in your worry and anxiety begin to really grate at the core of who you are. And I, I suppose that really when we deal with worry, there is a faith issue type to it too. Do you trust that God is good and that he wants to do good things for you? Do you trust that? It's one thing to believe that God is all powerful. It's another thing to believe that God is all good. But it is an entirely other thing to believe that God is all powerful and all good and he cares for you. That he would turn that goodness towards you. You know, in, in our social relationships, you know, do you believe that even if you fail, that God could redeem or repurpose or rescue that? Could you trust here in the church that the grace God gives you, the person next to you can, is also capable of showing you that grace if you make a social faux pas? If you don't raise your kids in the right kind of way that, that you think, or uh, if you think you're locked into some career stronghold, there's grace and mercy and peace here, is there not? The fruit of the city of man is this, right? Again, Jesus on this mountaintop looking down at the temple, and he's teaching us about this other kingdom. And I couldn't help but remind myself of the fruit of the Spirit. Uh, but if the fruit of the city of man is hatred, unforgiveness, indifference, coarseness, bigotry, hypocrisy, faithlessness, selfishness, and yes, maybe like worry could be a product of this human city. In this worldview that everything is running out all of the time, it's a scarcity mindset. I'm not going to have enough time. I'm not going to have the right things, the right relationships. This scarcity mindset begins to influence the very being that you are. But God's city produces, at least as we know through Galatians 5, 22 and 23, he says that the fruit of the Spirit, the thing that produces out of you through God's Spirit, he says is love and joy. Peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Worry, as Jesus is framing it in verse 27, it doesn't add to your lifespan, but it does take away from it. It takes away from your presence here in this moment. It takes away from who you are in your relationships because you're always worried about tomorrow, the next thing, when your parents get here, when the kids get picked up from school, or when you have to go to that work party, what you're going to say, what you're going to wear. There's so much about tomorrow that you might be fixated on that you can't even live presently here today with us. This is a deeply spiritual issue. So Jesus goes on to say in 28 of Matthew 6, he says, You know, why are you anxious about clothing? Look at the lilies of the field and how they grow. 
They don't toil nor spin, right? They're not sitting there creating their own clothes. Yet I tell you that even Solomon, King Solomon, the guy who had all of the money, that even the king of all wisdom, who had all money, in all of his glory, he wasn't dressed or arrayed like these little flowers. When you walk by this, uh, walk through this city of roses by any sort of rose bush, you might stop and think, look at how pretty that is. There's an innate beauty to creation that Jesus is pointing out. And though we have kind of our own constructs of what we think beauty is, most people have seen the mountain vista and know that that's really pretty or the deepness of the ocean <coughs> or, or even just the flowers on the rose bushes on the sidewalks. Jesus just reminds us that, you know, whatever your whatever anxiety and worry you're pushing in to beauty, it's already naturally in you, it's in creation. And that even if you had all of Solomon's money and all of Solomon's wisdom, you wouldn't look as pretty as those flowers. But there is a way of you, your being. Because he says in 30 that if God clothes the grass of the field, which today is alive and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, you know, how much more is he going to clothe you, a person of little faith? So he says, so don't be anxious saying, what are we going to eat, or what are we going to drink, or what are we going to wear? He says that the other nations seek after all of these things. He's like, everybody else in the kingdom of man is looking for this same stuff. They're in this same pursuit. And your Father in heaven, he knows that you need it all. He knows you need to eat. Uh, you know, they hadn't made Portland yet. They didn't know we could run around naked whenever we wanted and get on bicycles. So <laughs> he thought you also needed clothing too, right? Uh, there's like this low-key joke that I'm going to join the Naked Bike Race next year. Is it a joke? Is it real? I don't know. The family says no. I say, oh, I don't want to do it either. Maybe I should. So he's like, look, all of, all of, the, all of these other nations, all of the city of humanity is seeking after these things. They're worried about gaining. They're worried about these social interactions. They're worried about where their food is going to come from. The things that they're seeking and searching for that they're making the point of their life. God knows. God knows. You need to eat. God knows you need to have clothes. God knows that, he, that you should be a good parent, that you should care about what your parents think to a certain extent, that God knows all of these things, and he wants to take control of it from you. Because this is the big teaching. This is the point at which all of like Christian faith is founded, is in the next thing he says in the most important sermon from the most important preacher in world history on a mountaintop in the Middle East. He says, all of that aside, if you would just seek first the kingdom of God and God's righteousness, his goodness, if you would seek the goodness of God and his kingdom, if you would seek the king and his good kingdom, if you would make that your focus, if you would look towards that, <laughs> everything you're worried about is taken care of. All these other things are added unto you. And then he finishes this little sermonette in this giant sermon. Therefore, don't be anxious about tomorrow. That is to say, don't be so worried about that work party or how your kids are going to interact in this situation. Uh, don't be worried about what you're going to wear at church. Because tomorrow has plenty of worry for itself. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. Kind of this ominous, menacing reality, right? You are so worried about tomorrow that you are somehow missing what is important right here, right now, today. You're so worried about what's going to happen tomorrow that you're ignoring the relationships you're in right now. It's working backwards. Uh, which leads us to our, the final place on our map, Geppetto and Jesus. 
Um, if you know the story of Pinocchio, which I think is a timeless classic, maybe you just know the Disney version, that's good enough for now. <laughs> there is the toy maker Geppetto. And he has these deep desires in his heart to have a son. He's elderly and he's been widowed. And the likelihood of those desires coming to fruition are very low or impossible. And if you know the story, Geppetto, he raises his eyes to the heavens and he wishes upon a star. He believes on a heavenly reality greater than his circumstances. Because when you're desperate, when you realize you never did have control and that the things you worried about you couldn't affect anyways, the only place you can turn for real change is the heavens, is the Jesus, is the King. Jesus teaches us here in this most famous sermon that the Christian life is experienced not by focusing on my physical needs and my social worries, but by focusing on his city and his kingdom and his goodness, his righteousness, seeking his presence and his goodness above all else. Because if you get him, you get it all. And if you wanted his kingdom and, his, and this king more than everything else, he is just good enough and he's just righteous enough that he will take care of you forever. In this life and in the age to come. But if you can't get your eyes off of the scarcity of the human kingdom and this sort of evil of the city of man, you will never experience this rich life of faith and trust in the good God of all things. And I don't know if we ever take a moment to realize the words we sing, saying all hail King Jesus. All hail, like everyone surrender to this heavenly king. We believe that. We believe that when we're here together, we're just servants of that king. And we're all corporately taking a moment to recognize that reality. And if you feel connected to God in song, I have great news. Like that message can carry with you. You're, if you're seeking first his kingdom and his goodness and his righteousness, you are his servant. You are working with him and for him and through him. And he through you. And the world will look at you and they will think that you are crazy. I was told last week uh, by, I uh, own a coffee shop here in the city, I was told by one of my staff workers, Dustin, I hate people like you. And I was like, okay, why, Jordan? And uh, she goes, well, you see, you don't worry about a single thing. And everything just kind of works out. And she's like, I've been worried about this event for three weeks. And you just come in here and you're like totally chill. And I was like, well, Jordan, I'm just not worried about it. And she's like, that's what I hate. <laughs> the world will think you are crazy. You might hear things like you have a blind faith because what the world gets wrong about our gospel and our good news is that God is all-powerful, and he is all-good. And he directs that power and goodness towards his mission, which is your redemption and rescue. Our God is very much for you. And our world thinks that if he were all-good, he could not be all-powerful. He wouldn't be able to change anything. They look at the seasons and uh, the weather events, and they say, look, he could have stopped that hurricane, earthquake. He isn't all that. 
But, you know, the religious person gets the gospel wrong in many ways, too, because when he thinks of the gospel, he sees a God who loves those who behave. Uh, the religious people tend to think that you have to become culturally, culturally like them to experience the goodness, the rescue, and the mercy. But they're wrong, too. Because the radical reality of the gospel is that he's so good that he gave himself up to death for a lesser thing, you. And that intense love is so accessible through his spirit and through the work that the king did on the cross. That it has to change you. It is impossible to believe the gospel and not be different. Because if you're seeking first and fixated on this kingdom, it molds and shapes you in such a way that you can't get away from it. His rescue, it wasn't a test of like our morality. It was a show of his unmerited love towards us. And so we're reminded in Philippians 2, 5, and 6. Paul writes to our churches and says, Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus. Because Jesus, though he was in the form of God, he didn't count equality with God a thing to be grasped. But he emptied himself by taking on the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even the brutal cross. So if we want to be a church that is seeking and fixated on this kingdom more than on my worry of tomorrow, we have to be a people who live in this kingdom that's formed on the Mount of Olives. That though we can see this, the temple 75 meters down, though we can see like the human city all around us, we have to seek his good righteousness over virtue and showmanship. We have to love the people that no one else wants to love. And if you find yourself separating yourself from others because they're different than you, because they're into weird stuff, because they do the naked by grace or any others, that is someone who is deeply loved by the king. And he wants you to love them too. The invitation of the gospel is very inclusive. It says all who are weary and tired, come to me and I will give you rest. Not some, but all. And what forms us culturally as a people of God is our pursuit of the good king and the good king's kingdom. And that is the real promise of the gospel. You get the kingdom and the king right now. Not later than now. And if you want to truly experience it, you have to surrender and give up the city of man. The worries of tomorrow and the pursuit of stuff and things. And when you do that, love and goodness work through you to show love to each other. And so church, if you would just avert your gaze from the scarce city of man and into the abundant city of God, I really do believe that you will be able to sit back and ask, why worry?